The scripture reading will be taken from two parts today. The first one from Jeremiah 31, 1 to 6. At the time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survived the sword will find favor in the desert. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with lo loving kindness. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria, and the farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. The second part today will be taken from John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men who know that you are my disciples, if you will love one another. May the Lord bless this reading. Well, it's February month already. Can you believe it? It's the month of hearts and flowers and chocolates and valentines. And yes, for many of us, our birthday month. But it's the month when we particularly uh, celebrate love, loving relationships, particularly as it pertains to us as married couples and so on in our relationships. Well, there were many, many scripture references that I could have gone to today when it pertains to the love of God. But I chose simply Jeremiah 31 and particularly verse 3 and John 13, 34 to 35. And to Israel and to each one of us, God says today, I have loved you. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. The story is told of a soldier who lay wounded on the battlefield. And on that battlefield, a Christian padre crept out to where the soldier lay to try to help him. When the troops retreated, that padre stayed on. In the scorching heat of the day, he gave the soldier water from his own canteen while he remained parched with thirst. In the evening, when the temperature reached the freezing point, he covered the wounded soldier with his own coat. And finally, at the risk of death himself, he wrapped him in even more of his own clothing. The wounded soldier looked up at the Padre and he whispered this, Padre, are you a Christian? The Padre said, I try to be. I tried to be. Then said the soldier, if Christianity makes a man do for another man what you have done for me, then tell me about it, because I want what you have. This reminds us of Jesus' words in John 13 and 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. How? if you have love one for another. Romans 5 and 5 also reminds us how the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. We're filled to an overflowing as his people, an overflowing of love so much so that it is our desire to let others know about this wonderful God 
whom we serve. We want to share his love and his goodness. Although words alone seem so very inadequate to describe such a love as this, this love the Father has lavished upon you and upon me, for a few moments, I'd like us to think about, first of all, God's love as it pertains to the individual. God's love is individual. The latter part of Psalm 138, and particularly Psalm 139, are powerful verses reminding us of God's purpose and his plan for every person. You know, I pray this morning, that you know and you believe in your heart that you are a person of worth. You are precious. You are not here. You are not here by accident. Listen to his words to your heart as written by King David. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows you. God knows you by name. The Word of God tells us that even the very hairs of our head are numbered. Now, some of us don't have too much left, but God knows. God has even numbered the hairs of your head. You are so special to him. Every individual, man, woman, boy, and girl, is loved by the Father. And we are each a unique and very wonderful part of his creation. I love reading the gospel accounts, as I know you do, of our Lord Jesus, God in the flesh, and how he met and how he greeted people, how he touched individual lives with his healing and his transforming power. The broken, the wounded, the sick, the suffering, ordinary people changed and made new by the touch of the master's hand. And you and I, we're here today because we've received that wonderful transforming touch in our own lives. Remember Mary of Magdala, a woman demon possessed, a despised and lonely woman of the streets who was cleansed, who was forgiven and made whole by the powerful love of Jesus. She was transformed. She was given a brand new life and a whole new purpose for living because Jesus came to her. And in Luke 19, we all know the story of Zacchaeus. We've heard it since we were little. A man hated, a man who was ridiculed by society. This tax collector, small in stature, vertically challenged, but even smaller in the eyes of those who knew him. For years he had taken advantage of his position, collecting taxes from his people and pocketing much of the money for himself. Ah, but then one day, then one day Jesus passed by. Jesus passed through his town and up in a sycamore tree, there sits Zacchaeus rich in material possessions, but sin-sick and lonely, trying to catch a glimpse of this prophet and healer he has heard so much about. You know the story. Jesus stops at the bottom of that tree, and he looks up with piercing eyes of love 
into the very heart of this one individual needy soul. That day Zacchaeus is convicted of his sin. He's repentant, he is forgiven, and he is converted. He becomes a changed man. And his testimony would be something like this. In the eyes of Jesus, I saw the man that I could become. His conversion brought with it such a change of heart that Zacchaeus made retribution for the wrongs he had committed and paid back to every person four times as much as he had stolen from them. Well, the Bible is full of wonderful stories of individual lives that were changed by the power of God's love, and you too can share your testimony of that transformation. God's love is for the individual. God's love is for you, for me. And I pray that if there's someone here this morning that that love, God's love has not penetrated your heart, that today you will know that experience. May you see in the eyes of Jesus the man or woman you were meant to be and resolve to become that person by his grace. Secondly, God's love is indiscriminate. What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world. Regardless of race, age, sex, color, or social status, God loves us. He is not prejudiced in his love and in his grace. He sees beyond the outward appearance and facade, and he peers right into our heart. He gives to his followers the ability to see others with eyes of compassion and empathy. Aren't you glad that when you came to the church that there was a warm welcome extended to you, an outstretched and friendly hand, and a smile of gladness to see you? It was there that you made new relationships, and you made friends, and the church now appears, seems to be, to you, your own family. In the summer of 1963, when I, as a little girl, walked into the Salvation Army for the first time, there were warm smiles and such a welcome that I resolved to make the Salvation Army my church home. But not only my church home, but the place from which I would serve the Lord in full-time ministry. First impressions are so very important to those coming in through our doors, whether it's through the ministry of our family services, our hostels, our rehab centers, our thrift stores, or our local core. First impressions are so very important. Let me share with you a true story. It may be a story you've heard before, but it bears repeating. A pastor transformed himself into a homeless person, and he went to the 10,000-member church that he was to be introduced as the head pastor that morning. He walked around his soon-to-be church for 30 minutes while it was filling with people for service. Only three people out of that seven to 10,000 people even said hello to him. He asked people for change to buy food. No one in the church gave him change or even offered to buy him a meal. He went into the sanctuary to sit down in the front of the church and was asked by the ushers if he would please sit in the back. He greeted people to be greeted back with stares and dirty looks and people looking down on him. And as he sat in the back of the church, he listened to the church announcements and such. When all that was done, the elders went up and they were so excited to introduce the new pastor of the church to the congregation. We would like to introduce you 
to our new pastor. The congregation looked around, clapping with joy and much anticipation. The homeless man in the back, he stood up, and he started to walk down the aisle. And of course, all the clapping stopped, and all eyes were on him. He walked up the steps to the podium and took the microphone from the elders who were in on this and paused for a moment. And then he recited from Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. After he recited this, he looked towards the congregation and told them all what he had experienced that morning. Many began to cry, and others bowed their head in shame. He then said, Today I see a people, not a church of Jesus Christ. The world has enough people, but not enough disciples. When will you decide to become a disciple? He then dismissed the service until the following week. We as believers, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, we should do more than just talk about the fact that we believe. It ought to be a lifestyle a lifestyle that others around us see. And it's true that our actions speak so much more than words, and people see our deeds. We can be a Christian, we can say we are a Christian, but if we are following the teaching, teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we will indeed follow in his footsteps and we will be that word of love, that encouraging word, that shoulder to cry on, that hand outstretched in his name. God shows no partiality in his love toward his children, and neither should we. Some of us forget all too quickly the pit from which we came, and unfortunately tend to think of ourselves too highly than what we ought to think. God help us. God help us realize that at the foot of the cross we all stand on level ground, and but for the grace of God, there go we. May he help us to see others through his holy, love-filled eyes and accept one another as he has accepted us. God's love is individual, God's love is indiscriminate, and God's love is indescribable. We used to sing an old chorus. Do you remember it? I've got something in my heart that I cannot express. It's a joy that never grows old. I've tried to tell it again and again, but it's better felt than told. You remember that one? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's really old. <laughs> Second Corinthians 9 and 15 says this. Thanks be to God. 
for his indescribable, indescribable gift. The wonder of God's love is truly amazing, and it is overwhelming. Songwriters have tried to capture it, but words are inadequate to describe the experience of knowing God's great love for ourselves, But one thing we can be sure of, we can experience God's love. Amen? Amen. We can experience it to the very depth of our souls. As we empty ourselves of our sin, of our old habits, and the garbage that's been crowding out our lives and the we can allow God's forgiving love to fill us up to overflowing. God's love is indescribable, but as we look at Jesus, we see something of God's love. We see the life of God lived out in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see a wonderful description of this love and how we ought to love ourselves and others in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. How patient am I with others? Love is kind. Love does not think of itself more than it thinks of others. All those wonderful, wonderful verses and as we look at Jesus, we see a life lived out in love for his fellow man. A self-sacrificing, selfless, sincere, and supreme love. The songwriter said, could we with ink the ocean fill? Or were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry? Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And finally, God's love is indestructible. God's love will never die. Solomon wrote in Song of Solomon 8 and 7, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods wash it away. In recent days, we've heard and we've seen all of the devastation in the western states, the flooding and the mudslides, torrential rain, rivers overflowing their banks, homes washed away. What utter utter destruction. But you know, the rivers cannot quench God's love, cannot wash it away. God's great love remains. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. When kingdoms crumble and our names have long been forgotten, God's love will stand firm and steadfast. You see, from everlasting to everlasting, he is God and his love will never fail. Lindsay and I often visit. We visit the sick and the shut-ins and those who are in the hospital. And one beautiful portion of scripture that we often share is one that I'm going to share with you this morning as we bring our service to a close. And it's taken from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. And this is for you today. You may be experiencing some very difficult things in your life. There are those who are facing their coming death very shortly. But listen to the words of St. Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake 
We face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What an encouragement to our hearts today. I pray, I pray this morning that we will continue to recognize God's wonderful love for each one of us as individuals, a love that is indiscriminate, indescribable, indestructible, and as we read, inseparable. May we know this kind of love and be willing to reach out to one another and to a needy world in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior.